Hey guys, welcome to this installment of Quarantine, Coffee and Jesus. We're at the beginning of our third week looking at spiritual disciplines and today we're going to look at the spiritual discipline of worship. And I want to start by asking a question. What's the best thing you've seen or experienced this week and who did you tell? Uh, I watched Django Unchained, Tarantino movie again and I texted Cole about it because I was so excited about how good it was. I'm sure you have a similar Example, whenever we do things like that, we're participating in small expressions of worship. Worship just means worthiness. It's an acknowledgement of someone or something's worth when we give honor to someone or something in recognition of merit. And two things are going on when we do this. Um, firstly, it's good for us. It increases our joy. And then it also increases the worship of a particular thing. Rarely do you keep something of value to yourself. If you see a movie or hear a song that you love, you want to share it so that other people enjoy it as well, which means the amount of value placed on that thing or experience increases. And in the social media world that we live in, uh, we literally measure this with likes and views and shares. So worship elevates a particular thing and worship increases our enjoyment of that thing in particular and our joy in general. And we all worship something or someone, whether you're an atheist, a Muslim, a Christian, whatever your worldview. And the questions we need to ask are, who or what do we worship? How intentional are we about what we worship? And how worthwhile is the thing or person that we worship? And maybe that last question uh, is the most important. Because we can worship all sorts of things. Creation is good. We're made to enjoy it and to express that joy to God and to each other. But... The reality is some things are just more deserving of worship than other things. And some things are better at satisfying us than other things. And in a broken and sinful world, our desire to worship is distorted and problems come when we worship and overvalue finite things and when we look to them to satisfy us. And the more we try and squeeze enjoyment out of those things, the less effective they are at satisfying us. And this is where we start to get to the heart of what worship in the Bible is about. We're made to be connected to the one who made us. Creation is valuable, but the creator is more valuable than the creation. And therefore, the creator is more deserving of worship. Life is so good and is made to be enjoyed, but it's made to be enjoyed in relationship to, in service of, and with thankful hearts towards the one who is the source of our life and enjoyment. Only the one who is the source of infinite joy in life can satisfy us and is ultimately deserving of our worship. So... Worship in the Bible is seeing the worth and value of God and then responding with lives that express that worth and value. So how do we do that? Well, after the fall, which is described in Genesis chapter 3, the first book in the Bible, there's a serious break between the holy God who made the world and rebellious, sinful people. Uh, there was a breakdown in relationship and in worship. And then when God chose Abraham and his descendants, the Israelites, to be his chosen people, his vehicle to restore true worship to the world. He gave them strict guidelines around how to approach him and worship him. He gave them laws and sacrifices and spaces and times and even a special land where they would eventually build a temple where God's presence would dwell. And at its heart, this uh, structure of worship was still a response to who God was and what he had done. God had already loved Israel. He'd already rescued them and made them incredible promises. Worship wasn't a way of manipulating an outcome from God. It was a recognition and a celebration and a way of becoming more human in the way uh, God intended for us to be in the beginning. But there were limits to this structure of worship. Only certain people at a certain time and a certain place could participate and fulfill the requirements. And so when we get to Jesus in the New Testament, we see that these good things were just a shadow pointing to an even more glorious and accessible reality of worship. And in John 4, Jesus has a conversation with a woman whose life was super messy. She'd been married five times. And at the time she met Jesus, she was with a man who wasn't her husband. She was getting water from a well at a time in the day when no one else would be around because she was uh, too ashamed and she didn't want to be seen. And it's here that she runs into Jesus and Jesus meets her with grace and truth. He exposes her brokenness and he offers her healing. He offers her more than just water from a well that's temporary and won't last, but he offers what he calls living water that will give her life and satisfaction forever. She asked Jesus this question, Sir, I can see you are a prophet. 
Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus replied to her, Woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans will worship you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. I don't have time to explain all of that, but it's a great passage. And Jesus is basically saying that right and true worship is no longer about a particular geographical place. It's about a person and he is that person. Jesus is the ultimate expression of God's truth and God's presence. So if we come to him, then we will see and experience God fully, totally. So then Christian worship, true worship is all about Jesus. And in fact, after he died, rose and ascended to the throne of the world, he sent his spirit to dwell in us so that now his very truth and presence is inside of us, helping us to see and worship him with everything we are. And now we, the church, are his physical representation in the world so that our worship of him not only helps us experience him personally, but helps the world to experience what God is like and what it's like to live under his kingdom, under his good rule. And in this, we get to experience uh, a glimpse of what it means to be fully human. So actually, when properly connected to Jesus, all the spiritual disciplines we've been studying together over the last couple of weeks are an expression of worship. In the book of Romans, chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says, in view of God's mercy, which is just laid out in the previous 11 chapters, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Worship includes what we do during service on a Sunday, preaching, singing, praying, but it's much bigger than those things. It's our whole lives. So cultivating habits of thanksgiving, forgiveness, generosity, hope, praise, sacrifice, service, integrity, love, the fruits of the Spirit uh, are all expressions of worship, which are so beautiful and deeply human. And they show who God is, his infinite worth and value. And they might even lead someone else to see it for themselves and then want to respond in the same way. So that's worship in general. Let's finish by talking uh, about singing because it's really important and very close to my heart. There's lots of reasons why singing, why song worship is so good for us as individuals and for us as a church community, but I'm going to give you eight. Each of these could be a talk in and of themselves, but I'm just going to smash through them real quick. So uh, why do we sing? Firstly, we sing because God sings. In the book of Zephaniah, the back end of the Old Testament, um, it says this, the Lord your God is with you. He's in your midst. He's a mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will delight in you with loud singing. God sings his love over us. And so we respond by singing uh, with love back to him. Two, it's commanded. Uh, the Bible contains over 400 references and 50 direct commands to sing. And the longest book in the Bible, the Psalms, is a book of songs. So I'm so sorry. If you don't like singing, then we'll have to pray that the Holy Spirit changes your heart. Three, we sing because God is most worthy of praise. People throughout history have written songs about love, loss, pain, politics, work, significant social and cultural moments, great moments of existential crisis, and of course, baby sharks. The list is endless. And most of those things are great things to sing about, but how much more worthy is our creator and redeemer? Psalm 145 verse 3 says, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Four, I told you we'd go quick. We sing to proclaim God's goodness and greatness to the world. Psalm 96 verse 3 says, Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all the peoples. As a church, as Christians, we aren't supposed to just hide away from the scary world and sing songs to make us feel better. Although sometimes the world is scary and sometimes songs can and do make us feel better. But our singing is also meant to be a public declaration of who God is, his goodness and his greatness. Church isn't just a holy huddle and we aren't just singing to ourselves. Our services are open to the public. How much more in this uh, online uh, season of, you know, just online. Um, and our songs are helping to witness to a watching world. Art in general and songs in particular are so effective 
at pointing people towards a God of beauty and goodness. Five, we sing to tear down false gods. Uh, there are all sorts of things and people in this world that uh, we might be tempted to worship because they offer us security, satisfaction, meaning, purpose, safety, love. When we sing, we, we are lifting up the name of our God, but we aren't just lifting up the name of our God. We are also tearing down all those false gods and idols that would, would try and take his place, which means that, I think this is exciting, at its best, our songs should be dangerously subversive and aggressively countercultural. And think about that the next time we sing these words. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. Six, we sing to express our unity and to encourage one another. We think of uh, worship in two planes. It might be a little bit uh, simplistic and crude, but um, we worship God. That's the vertical plane. And then uh, we worship together in community. And that's the horizontal plane. This uh, next point is addressing that horizontal plane. We sing to express our unity and to encourage and build one another up. Unity is a really important thing throughout the Bible. I don't have time to go into it, but you just have to take my word for it. Um, and songs are such a powerful expression of unity. All our voices, which are characterized by different ranges and textures, ages, sexes, races, etc., are all joined together to make one voice, one sound. Uh, I heard a worship leader answer the question, uh, what do you love about leading worship? He answered it this way. He said, getting that many people in a room to agree on anything is a miracle. And no matter our differences, we stand together when we sing with one voice and declare that we have one faith, one Savior, one Lord. In Ephesians 5, Paul talks about us singing to one another. And this community aspect of worship means that we need to be thinking about our neighbor when we're singing uh, perhaps even more than we're thinking about ourselves. Obviously, uh, this looks different right now in a global pandemic when we're quarantined and, and separate. Um, but there will be times when your voice, no matter how weak you think it may be, might carry the person around you. And then there'll be other times when someone else carries you. Jesus is building his church and singing together is a part of that. Seven, we sing to help us remember God's word and to remember our story in light of who God is and what he's done. How often have you forgotten the line from a sermon, but the lyric of a song stays with you? That's not a knock on sermons. They're super important, but it's a recognition of the power of songs. Uh, there are two places in the Old Testament where an event is recorded with historical narrative. And then in the very next chapter, the same event is recorded in the form of a song. And that's because it's a recognition that songs help us remember things and we need to remember things. We need to remember God's uh, words and we need to remember uh, the story that he's writing in the world. Um, I can tell you that God loves you and has set you free, or I can with melody, rhythm, poetry, instruments, and voices sing over you and with you. Who am I that the highest King would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free, I was free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. And then number eight, we sing to worship God with every part of us. Uh, the guy who wrote the song from uh, Wizard of Oz, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, said this, words make you think a thought, music makes you feel a feeling, but songs make you feel a thought. Singing combines thoughts and feelings in a way that nothing else does. We can understand with our head and feel with our hearts simultaneously. God has given us the gift of songs to help renew and transform people as they see his mercies again and again, as they plumb the depths of who he is and what he's done. And Jesus reminds us that uh, worship is loving God with everything we are, with our minds, our soul, our hearts, and our strength. This is holistic. Jesus demands all of us. And singing is one of the few activities that engages all of us. It uses our heads, it uses our bodies. Your voice is an internal instrument. Your body will release endorphins when you sing. And our hearts and our souls and our emotions, who we are, are engaged. Singing helps us, all of us, better see, understand, fathom, know, feel, and enjoy God's truth, beauty, and goodness. There's so much more I could say, but let me just finish with this. 
when we worship, whether it's together or apart, whether you have a good voice or a lousy voice, we're joining with a song that is much bigger than us. This is a song of creation that sung the world into existence. This is a song of recreation that throughout history has been redeeming and restoring God's people. This is a song of new creation that will make all things new where each chorus is more glorious than the one before and resounds throughout every moment of eternity. The God who sings over us invites us to join in his song. I love you guys.